All right, welcome everyone. Today we are going to talk about how to graph polynomials, just how to sketch them. Just their general shape is good enough. Um, so let's start off by talking about the, the end behavior. Okay. So I'm going to just describe the um, leading term test. That's going to tell us. So the oops, leading term test tells us the end behavior of a polynomial. Sorry, clearly there's no spell check on these text boxes. Okay, of a, so I can fit polynomial in. Okay, so let's just describe it. So let's say you have some sort of polynomial and its leading term is a sub n x to the n. Okay, and there's other stuff, right? Like plus blah, 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 blah. Okay, but we don't really care about that. We're just going to look at the front end, okay? So always look here first. You've always got to figure out what the uh, right-hand side is doing. So this one tells us what the right is doing. And do that first. And then this one tells us what the left is doing. I'm going to do that second, OK? So if, if negative, then what that means is it'll go down to the right down to the right. Okay, if positive, if that leading coefficient is positive, the number out front, then it's gonna go up to the right. So, you know, let's say that we have some polynomials. Let me go ahead and put in uh, GeoGebra. Okay, so let's say I've got some polynomial and I throw a positive number out front. Oops, I'm all in the exponent, of course. Okay, let's see here. Okay, what you can see is this right-hand side is going up, okay? If I were to throw a negative five out front instead of a positive five, well, now you can see that the right-hand side goes down. Okay, and let me change a couple, change the exponents. So still a negative five out front, it's still gonna go down to the right. If I change that negative five to a positive five, ah, now it goes up to the right, okay? So that's what we mean by the number out front will control the right-hand side. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about the exponent. So the exponent tells us what the left is doing. If even, Uh, the left and the right do the same thing. The left and right. Sorry, guys, I'm, I have horrible handwriting, and I don't know what this little thing is right here. I'm just making it easy. There we go. The left and right do the same. So even the same. If odd... I always like to think of this as the two O words. If odd, they do the opposite. It's like it was meant to be odd opposite. Okay. All right. So let's look at this in action. Um, if we go back to this graph, right? Since this was odd, the three, and I'm only looking at the leading term, right? So I don't care about all these other exponents. Since it was a three and it's odd, they're doing the opposite. It's up to the right and it's down to the left. If I change that three to a four, like it was on the previous example, well, now the right and the left are doing the same. They're both going up, up to the right, up to the left, okay? All right, so let's go check out some examples. We'll try to uh, guess whether or not what the right and the left are doing, okay? All right, so I'm specifically looking at x to the fifth only, right? Now in front of the x to the fifth is a one. Okay, and that's going to tell me what the right-hand side is doing, and I've got to do that first, okay? So we know that since it's positive, since positive, that's going to imply up to the right. 
And sometimes you'll see like a little almost ordered pair where they'll just draw an arrow on the right hand side to let you know up to the right. Okay. Then we're going to go up here to our exponent. That's the second thing we do. Since odd, that implies, remember the two O words, odd implies the left does the opposite. Left does the opposite. Okay, so if we're going up to the right, then we're going to go down to the left. Down to the left. All right. So in a picture, I mean, what does this mean? This means the right hand side will go up, the left hand side will do down. And, you know, we'll figure out eventually the middle, you know, we'll see how many wiggles and stuff it does, but we're not concerned with the middle right now. Let's go graph it in GeoGebra so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Let me delete this one out. All right, so we got x to the fifth minus 5x to the third. Let me go see the rest. It's all my memory. Plus 4x. There we go. So it does go up to the right and it does go down to the left. Remember we said all those wiggles in the middle, we don't really care about, but we have the correct end behavior. All right, let's try it again. Repetition is gonna get this into our memory. Now, the problem with this one is it's not foiled out. You know, you, you wanna ask this question once it's all been foiled out. It's not multiplied out. We don't, need to multiply the whole thing. We just need the first term. The leading term. So, you know, do a little cheater way. We, not really cheater, but smart. How about that? We don't really want everything boiled out. That would take a long time, you guys. Imagine doing x plus 1 to the third power. Holy moly. And you still got to multiply it by other things. So really all you want to look at is the leading term in each set of parentheses, and you just want to multiply that. So we're going to do negative 2 times x times x times x times x. So it looks like that's going to get us negative 2 x to the fourth. Okay. All right. So let's take that negative 2 x to the fourth, and let's analyze it. Okay. So we always start with the front number. That's going to tell us what the right is doing. Since negative, that's going to imply down to the right. So that means in our little ordered pair, bam, we're going to do an arrow down. All right, now let's go check out that exponent. So the exponent is 4, right? Okay, so since even... That's going to imply that the left does the same. Left is the same. So if the right went down, the left will go down. Okay. So our graph will go this way and we'll go that way. And again, we don't know, you know, da 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 da, what the middle is going to do, but we do know that both ends are going to go down. So let me go put this in negative two x minus 5, negative 2, x minus 5, and then x plus 1 to the third. I think that was it, but let me just go check. Perfect. Okay. So you can see that both are going down, right? We're going down, um, we're going down to the right, we're going down to the left, exactly as we suspected, right? Maybe it's good to zoom out a little bit. Okay. All right. Let me get a tool on really quickly. This tool is very helpful. So you can see the whole graph. There you go. But it is going down on both sides. Okay. All right. So hopefully you feel pretty good about that. You look at that front number first. That's going to tell you what your right is doing. Once you've figured out what your right is doing, head up here to the exponent to figure out what the left is doing. All right. 
Number three, determine the zeros of a function. So since we're trying to find the zeros, you gotta make sure you set it equal to zero. Okay, let's see. Okay, since we are trying to find the zeros, set it equal to zero. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put zero equals, right? And then we're gonna write down that polynomial. And this is synonymous with what we're doing here is we're actually finding the x-intercepts where it crosses the x-axis because that's where y is zero, okay? All right, I'm looking at this and then I'm gonna try factor by grouping because it has one, two, three, four terms. And we've used that a lot in this class. Let's see if it works. So if I slice this down the middle, I can take out an x squared and that'll leave me with x minus five. I have to take out a negative, right? Got to take out a negative, whatever I do. All right, and it looks like I'm gonna take out a 16 would be my guess, okay? And if you check, 16 times five is 80. Let's just check really quickly. Yeah, okay, there it is, it is 80. All right, so we're good there. And we got the same thing twice, which is a really good sign, right? Oops, it should be minus five because I factored out a negative. Sorry, guys. All right, so when you take out a negative, don't forget to change the signs like I just forgot. All right, so we got x minus five as one of them. And then the leftovers are the other, right? So x squared minus 16. Now, x squared minus 16 factors more. It's a difference of squares, right? Okay, so this is a difference of squares. And remember that if you have a squared minus b squared, a difference of squares, it's a plus b, a minus b. That's going to be the formula. Okay. All right. So we've got zero equals x minus five. And basically, I just think of it as square rooting each piece. So if I square rooted each one, right, like the square root of this is x and the square root of that is four, that's what I'm going to be putting into the, to the boxes, an x and a four. And then just make sure the signs are different. Easiest number for you guys. Yeah. All right. And then we're going to use the um, product property, right? All of these things are multiplying to equal zero. Well, if they all multiply to equal zero, then at least one of them's got to be zero, right? All right. And we're so good at this. Let's just go right to it. X equals five. X equals negative four and x equals positive four. And of course on connect math, you guys, it would probably be Alex, since we're moving to Alex pretty soon, five, negative four, four would be your answer for that. Okay, and so it tells you up here different names for them too, right? These could also be called the x-intercepts. These could also be called the roots. These could be called the solutions. These could be called the zeros. All right. Determine the zeros and the multiplicity. So same directions. We're just going to up the what we're finding here. Okay. And the multiplicities will be important in our graph. So you'll see why we care in a second. But for now, let's just figure out what the multiplicity is. And then um, we'll show you what it means in the graph in a second. Okay, so we already know we're going to be setting it equal to zero since we're finding the zeros. And we're in luck. This one has already been factored for us. If only they could all be this nice, right? Okay. All right, so we're going to set each piece equal to zero, right? And technically, this is this. I just want to point out, technically, it's this, right? And so we're going to set each piece equal to zero. Now, I only have to set one of these equal to zero because like this is going to be the same math, right? So it's like, why do that? That's the same math, okay? Same thing's true about this here. You know, I really only need to set one x plus three equal to zero because the other two, right, um, are the same exact math, okay? All right, so when we divide by eight to both sides, zero divided by eight, is zero. From this one, we get x equals one. And then from the other one, when you move the three over, you're gonna get x equals negative three. Now, 
We need to talk about their multiplicities. That basically means how many times does that occur as a zero? And if you haven't written it out like I have here, okay, you can see here, I would get one as a zero two times. So this one would have multiplicity. Uh, I better write the word out, sorry. Multiplicity two. Okay. And if you haven't written it out like I have, right? where you've written it out twice, just go up here. The exponent is the multiplicity. So you can see all of the multiplicities for each one of these zeros. One, multiplicity two, and multiplicity three, right? And that makes sense for multiplicity three for the x plus three, because we had it three times, right? So it's going to occur as a zero three times. Multiplicity of three. And this one would just be a multiplicity of one. Okay, so the multiplicity is the exponent. It's going to be our quick way of thinking about it. Yeah. Go ahead and box the answer. All right, so what effect do the multiplicities of the zeros have on the graph? Okay, now notice all of these have the same exact zeros. X equals zero is a zero, X equals one is a zero, and X equals negative three is a zero. All of them, zero, positive one, negative three. 0, positive 1, negative 3. So they all have the same zeros, but look how drastically different the graphs are. Okay. Now the exponents are 1s on all these. And so the 0, the 1, and the negative 3 are what we call crosses, cross points. Okay. Since they all had multiplicity 1, the zeros are all cross points. Boom. Okay. Now on this next one, some are odd, uh, some are odd and ones, but now we have a two in there. Okay. So x equals zero, it crosses through. X equals negative three, it crosses through. Right, it just crosses through the x-axis there. It crosses through the x-axis there. But this x equals 1 has a different behavior. It does not cross through. It's kind of small, so hopefully you guys can see. At 1, it comes down, nicks it, and turns around. It never crosses through the graph, right? It just kind of is tangent to it. It nicks it at 1 right there. Okay, so that is what we call a touch point. Okay, so this would be called a touch point. Okay, so if we were going to um, move this up a little bit to give us some room to type. So how we would describe this is we would say the zeros with odd multiplicity, I'm going to make it even more big, not just one, but odd numbers, are cross points. And the zeros with even multiplicity are touch points. I've heard all kinds of different names for these. Your book uses touch points. Probably a better word would be tangent, but they're just trying to make it really clear. Say no tangent might be something a lot of people haven't heard. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go in here. We're gonna look at the exponents to get the multiplicity on this next example. Multiplicity one, that's a cross. Multiplicity one, that's a cross. Multiplicity two, that's a touch. So at negative three, you can see that it's a touch point at negative three. 
but the other two do cross through. We cross through zero. We cross through one. But a negative three, we just turn around, okay? So this would be our touch. And then these two would be our cross points, okay? Okay. So it is really important, the multiplicity of each one of these zeros, because that's going to determine how, how many, if it crosses or touches at that spot, okay? And so this box right here is really, really important, okay? And so they, they just say it right here in red, so it's nice and bold for you, okay? Coming up what we just said on the last slide. All right, this one says, identify the zeros and determine whether there is a cross or a touch at that point. Okay, so to find the zeros, we're gonna set it equal to zero. Okay, so if we go in here and we set each piece equal to zero, oops. I don't know if you could just tell that the first one's zero. Really, you just have to set the x equal to zero. But for some reason, students like me to do the math so that they can see uh, y. Zero divided by anything is zero. You would square root, and the square root of zero is zero. Okay. All right. So then this one would be negative four. I'm going to write it down here. And this one would be positive seven. OK. All right, so let's go in here and determine whether these are touches or crosses and stuff, okay? All right, so for this first one, we have to look at the exponent on that. The exponent is two for that one, right? Since the exponent was two, it has even multiplicity. So it is a touch point. Let me make this smaller. All right. Then we'll go into the next one. So for this one, the negative four had an exponent of one. So since the exponent was one. It has odd multiplicity. So it is a cross point. Okay. okay. And then finally, this last one. And by the way, I make, want to make sure everybody sees what I'm talking about when I say these exponents, right? The exponent was two for the first one. It was one for the second one. And now it's third three for this one, right? To the third power. So since the exponent was three, which is odd, right? So it is a cross point. Only evens are touches, right? Oops. Okay. Okay. And so that would tell us a lot, um, you know, in the graph. Let's see, it's negative out front, so it's down to the right. Let's see here. Seven is a root. Zero is a root. And negative four is a root. It's down to the right. It would be six, so it would also be down to the left. So it should look something like this. We're going to cross at seven. Zero had multiplicity two, so it's going to be a touch. And then we'll cross through negative four since it was odd. You know, something like that would be what our graph would look like. I don't know how high or how low to make it dip and stuff, but something along those lines, okay? 
All right. Turning points. So in the graph, whenever you have a relative maximum or a relative minimum, those are going to be turning points, okay? And there is a relationship between the highest exponent and the, the most amount of turning points. Since the highest exponent on this polynomial is three, exponent is three, you always subtract one from it, okay? Uh, there will be at most, we're not saying there will be that many, at most two turning points. So always one less. And you guys can see that in the formula here. See n minus one. That's telling you to subtract one. Now there could be le less, right? And some x cubes, as you know, have zero turning points. This is x cubed itself and it never turned. That's why it's important that you understand at most. So it's possible for it to have uh, one turning point, which would look like this maybe, something like that. It only turns around right here, okay? This one has no turning point, okay? And the one that we're looking at in the picture has two. So it could be zero, one, or two. Okay, make sure you subtract one from the exponent to find the highest possible amount. Okay. If you think about it, I think I'm going to leave it there. Let's get sketch some polynomials here, you guys. So here's a little, um, like a list of things to do to help you graph the polynomial. And we'll go through um, and get these things, okay? All right. So for the general shape, I think what I'd like to replace that with is end behavior, just to make sure that it's very clear to everybody what that's asking for. So let's put end behavior here. Okay. All right. So if we looked at the leading term, it's not multiplied out. So we have to think if we took x minus one times x minus one times x plus three times x minus four, and we looked at all of the front numbers, dun, 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 x times x times x times x, we would get x to the four. Now I'm going to insert the one. So remember, because this one, is positive, right? This one right here, positive implies up to the right. I have some students who only memorize the up and I'm like, okay, that's great. To the right or to the left, right? So you've got to make sure you know that that's um, to the right. All right, and then if we look at the um, four, since that's even, the left will do the same. Left is same. So for our end behavior, it went up to the right. It's also going to go up to the left. Okay, number of turns. So remember to always take the n and subtract one. Well, the highest exponent is four. We said if we multiply it all out, the highest exponent is four. So four take away one equals three. So this will have at most three turns. Okay. All right. Now let's go ahead and get our x intercepts. Remember that means your zeros. So you're going to take it and you're going to set it equal to zero. So when we set each piece equal to zero, we're going to find our x intercepts. I'm going to go graph them on the graph here. Okay? One, negative three, and four. Okay. I'm also going to graph the end behavior. We said up to the right, and we also said up to the left. Okay. Now we're going to look at our exponents to get the multiplicity, right? So write your exponents, and here's our exponents, you guys. So since the multiplicity is two, for this one, that implies a touch. Since the multiplicity is one for this one, that implies cross. 
And since the multiplicity is one for this one, that implies a cross also. So I'm going to try to show that in the graph. So I have to touch at uh, one. So we're going to cross through this. We're going to cross through that. And we're going to touch there. Let me make a better touch. Make it more loopy. I'm going to do a little race and try to make that a little better looking. Wait, oh, sorry. Yeah, I got a little bit off here. Okay, so one and four. It's one that's the touch point, right? So I'm going to go to one and I'm going to touch there and then I'm going to cross through four. Okay, so let me just recap. X equals one. That is going to be a touch. You go to where x equals one, it indeed looks like we just touched. x equals negative three and x equals four are crosses. So at negative three, we cross through, and at four, we, we cross through. We did not make it a touch point. And what's kind of crazy is these are like really close to being spot on as far as the graph is concerned. Um, I mean, we would get more, more detail to get more spot on, but I mean, they're good enough. Okay, so what was it? Let me go back and check. X minus one squared, X plus three, X minus four. Look how good that is, right? That's like almost exactly our graph. I mean, we could probably zoom in a little bit. Go back and look at our graph, right? I mean, spot on. Looks really, really good. We crossed, we touched, we crossed, we crossed, we touched, we crossed. Okay. Um, let me get this so you can make sure the four is obvious, but there you go one and negative three. This looks spectacular. Okay. Sketch the function. Okay. All right. So let's go in here and get the end behavior. Oops. Okay, so we want to say, okay, if we multiplied this all out, and we looked at these things and we multiply them by each other, that'd be negative one times x times x times x, which would get us negative one x to the third. So the front number tells us, since it's negative, that the right will go down. Since the exponent is, oops, I meant to change to green. Since the exponent is odd, that implies the left is the opposite. Okay, so if we're going down to the right, then the left must be going up. So that's going to be our end behavior. Okay, let's go in here. And what was the next thing we had to get, you guys? The turns, right? Oh, I forgot to harp on the turns. So if you look at how many turns we had, we said at most three. Well, there's a turn, there's a turn, and there's the turn. So spot on with the turns, right? There we go. Okay. So if we do n minus one to get the turns, n minus one, our highest exponent was three. So three minus one equals two. So at most two turns. All right, now let's go in and get, what else do we see, the zeros? So we're gonna go ahead and, or x-intercepts, right? Zero, oops, let me do that in black. The zeros are x-intercepts. Okay, so if we set the whole thing equal to zero, and you just need to set the parentheses, you guys. You don't have to like, there's a squared on here, right? Just set the stuff inside the parentheses equal to zero. That's enough. Because if it's zero and you square it, it's still going to be zero, right? 
So we get x equals negative 1, and we get x equals 3. So negative 1 and 3 are our zeros. We know it goes down to the right and up to the left. Okay. Now the multiplicity on these is 1 and 2. So since it's 1, that implies that it's going to be across. And since this one is 3, or I'm sorry, is 2, that implies that it's going to be a touch. Remember, even is a touch, odd is a cross. So at negative 1, I'm going to cross. So at negative 1, I'm going to cross. And then at 3, I'm going to touch. OK? All right. Something like that. I didn't get the y-intercept to see exactly where it crosses the y-axis. I think it looks like it's going to cross at like negative 9. But I don't know that I care too much. Okay, I want just the general shape of this. Um, this looks, you know, good enough. Okay. All right. You apply the intermediate value theorem. So, oops, sorry, guys. So the intermediate, is that our last one? Okay, let me just delete these two slides out. The intermediate value theorem. It's stated here kind of bare bones because you're going to see it again in calculus and so it'll be more general than this, but we're going to use it in, in terms of a polynomial. So basically all it says is that let's say you have some graph and here's A and here's B, okay, on the x-axis. It says let A be less than B. Well, we've shown that we put A on the left of B, so it's smaller. If F of A and F of B have opposite signs, so what that means for them to have opposite signs is maybe one of them is negative and one of them is positive. It didn't have to be this way. It could have been vice versa. F of A could have been positive and F of B could have been negative. But if you have that, then you're guaranteed to have at least one zero in between A and B because if I have some sort of polynomial, right, I can't lift my pencil. So that means that, you know, when I go to connect this dot to the other dot, bam, right there, I had to pass through zero at some point to get from F of A to F of B. So there's our zero right there. Now it's at least one because who knows how this thing, how this polynomial behaves. The polynomial could have like, you know, been like, da, 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 you know, and it hit one, two, three times. I mean, who knows how many times it wiggled back and forth between A and B but we're guaranteed at least one zero, okay? On in between A and B on the interval of A to B, right? So somewhere in between these two. Okay, so this says show that F of X uh, has a zero on the interval of negative one to zero. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in negative one, we're gonna plug in zero, and we're gonna hope that they have opposite signs, right? Okay, so plug, in negative one and zero and show that they have opposite signs. Why they always plant this right on top of what your text box is. Okay, um, opposite signs. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna substitute in one, one, one into the polynomial. And then we're going to substitute zero into the polynomial, which, thank goodness, that's like my favorite number of the polynomial, right? I mean, we know the answer already, but it is your notes, so I write everything down. But hopefully you're going, hey, Mecklenburg, 35, that's the last number. The zeros are going to make all these guys cancel out, right? So it looks like f of zero is 35. Okay. So I'm gonna get more detailed. Here's our picture. At zero, we know we're at 35. That's for when X is zero, right? Okay. All right, now let's go and get the value when X is negative one. So let's say this is negative one. Negative one cubed is still negative. Negative one squared is positive. Positive 33 times negative one.
negative 13 times 1 is negative 13. Okay, I'm going to add up all my negatives. So if I add up these three with each other, let's see here, 33 plus 14. I'm getting negative 47 plus 35. Looks like it's negative 12, you guys. Okay, so let's say negative 12 is right here. There we go. All right, here's our part of our graph. You know, if I have to draw a polynomial through it, who knows how it looks, I have to cross it at least one zero to get from one dot to the next. But we're going to write a summative sentence. This is more like a sentence type answer than it is number crunching, right? Okay. Since f of zero was positive and f of negative one was, I want those to be together, so give me a second. F of negative one was negative. They have opposite signs. Opposite signs, opposite signs. Therefore, there is at least one zero on the interval of negative one to zero by the intermediate value theorem. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. So plug in the two numbers they give you. And hopefully they have opposite signs, you guys, and then you are good to go. Okay, guys, that is the it. That's it for three one. Have a great day. Take care.